Welcome back, everyone. So here is the time for the Q&A and panel session for the Mauer, uh, sec the Mauer block of the NorthSec conference. Uh, first, please welcome Suhera. Uh, she's a, a senior uh, security researcher at, at CrowdStrike. Uh, she will be uh, doing a, a workshop on static malware analysis uh, starting at 4 o'clock today, I think, just a few minutes after the, uh, the, the panel. Uh, and uh, it will be continued tomorrow. So it's a two-day two workshop, probably super interesting. Um, and uh, we have our presenters. Uh, uh, everyone is here. Uh, so um, I will be asking questions from the audience. Uh, it, it's not too late. Uh, if you do have questions, I do have the, uh, the um, your question will uh, pop up here on, uh, I have my laptop open in front of me, so if, uh, if you still have questions or follow-up questions, uh, feel free to send them to Slido, Slido and uh, I will be able to ask them. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for your uh, very good presentations. Um, and I have a, I have a, f a few uh, very good questions uh, from the, the audience. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, the ones about air gap network. This is the subject that I think um, uh, we got the most uh, question about. Um, so I, I, have, I have a few questions where uh, people were asking about um, you know all the um, proof of concepts that that was uh, presented at the, uh, various uh, places uh, where you know you can extract data with uh, with light or with uh, LEDs or with uh, sound or with any kind of um, uh, other methods uh, so you presented about USB uh, do they do you think that they are uh, really a proof of concept or do you think that they really apply to the the in in the real world so great question because one of the reasons also behind our research was to see how much of these techniques were in the wild um, and, and the answer is really like not as so they're not in the wild as far as public knowledge is concerned so it's not impossible that attacks happen and they were either never detected or never reported on publicly um, that being said those Techniques don't execute out, out of thin air. They, there still needs to be a payload that will implement whatever, like uh, using uh, speakers and microphones or things like that. So there's still malicious code that will implement those techniques, and that code can be detected. So um, it's not, it's, those are cool techniques for sure, um, but before, if, if you manage an air gap network, before you implement a Faraday cage around everything, make sure you tackle the USB stick problem first, <laughs> properly, and that you manage uh, software updates, and then you can focus on, on that kind of stuff. And do you think that the, the lack of, um, uh, of us seeing it, seeing it in the wild is due to the fact that we, we don't have the telemetry, we don't, we couldn't actually collect them? It's a, it's a factor, but then again, what, what we detect in terms of like the malware that we know that uses USB, we don't necessarily detect the use of USB as a covert mechanism itself. We will detect the files, like the malware that will write to USB, to USB drives, or that will uh, gain persistence on the system, or that will uh, iterate on the file system and find files to, 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 to copy. Um, so the, the, the physical communication mechanism that jumps the air gap is just one tiny part of the whole attack. And even though it's, yeah, of course it's hard to detect like lights flashing at a certain speed. Um, it's hard to detect, but there's a plenty of other things that, that can be detected. So I'm, I think that it's not necessarily because of lack of being able to detect that, that we don't see it in the wild. I have a follow-up question, but I think everyone can can answer. Uh, well, give their opinion. Um, is about how you know it's always more sexy to talk about the the how we break stuff. You know, the, uh, how, how we were actually able to uh, compromise something or uh, talk about potential uh, attacks. Uh, but 
it, it seems that we get more less uh, media attention when it comes to uh, new ways around protecting against those those attacks. Uh, do you think, as an industry, we should focus more on uh, the novel defense techniques rather than always like uh, spending so much effort into uh, like red team or you know uh, uh, trying to break the the the, the security of the different systems. So I've got an opinion on that. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, let's hear you first then. <laughs> of course it makes better headlines saying this is how I broke that instead of this is how I defended against a hypothetical attack. Um, but the problem when you show how to break something without showing how to defend against it, like who is who will benefit from that information? Who benefits from a technique to break something that cannot be defended yet? So I think it's the responsible thing is at least to give some ideas. Sometimes it cannot be fixed easily, but at least give some, some ideas of how to mitigate, how to detect. Otherwise, you're just giving hints for attackers to, to break more stuff. Okay, so I agree with that, and uh, I'd l also like to add that it's a question of risk assessment as well. Um, so, you know, attackers, and I mean, in, even including ourselves that are not attackers, we're still kind of lazy, right? So you will try to find that low-hanging fruit, and that's kind of what you're going to start by going after. And so, yes, all these flashy new techniques are very great and stuff. I don't think they have to be overlooked. I think they're worth talking about. But we have to not forget that things like defense and depth and um, making sure that you have all your basics covered are also really worth it as well. <laughs> so um, I've had a, a question for you uh, regarding your, your presentation, uh, Leanne. Um, so, uh, do you think uh, it would be possible to uh, further uh, help the decompilation uh, to, to, to see an equivalent of the JavaScript that was actually uh, used as source for, the, for producing the V8 snapshots? Uh, yes, certainly, and that's a great question. So what we saw was a okay result, and we were able to work with it, but it was not ideal. And I do believe that we could make that a lot better, um, especially regarding like all these properties. So like when we're you know loading a, a library and it you know you do like dot something dot something dot something, it creates like tens and lines of codes and it's like really hard to read. So I do believe that the next steps for that specific tool will be to improve the result of the decompilation, and I do think that it's possible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. I have a, a question for Ashir. Um, so, um, regarding the Canary tokens, uh, so what do you think? Uh, so, when pe people make defensive tools, uh, when, when they provide some kind of uh, uh, services that can be used as Canary token, is there any? mitigations uh, that they can use to avoid misuse by bad actors? Yeah, so uh, Canary tokens is one of the tools and services that fall into the gray area. You know, they can be used by legitimate parties such as red teamers, but they can also be used by bad adversaries to serve their purposes as well. I think it's very important for service providers of these services to proactively figure out if their platform is being misused. Uh, and also, it is the responsibility of the of the community, you know, researchers like us, so that we can provide the right kind of threat intelligence that prompts people and organizations to block uh, certain events that are being used or certain artifacts that are actually misusing them. So you have to have a proactive model where they can do takedowns and they can proactively go out and find um, misuse of their platforms. This is for, for for the service providers, and then you have to couple that with the right kind of threat intelligence so that other organizations can also protect themselves, you know, until a vendor or a service provider takes action. And I have another question. Uh, do you think it's also a, um, a problem because um, the, those canary tokens generate logs on someone's server? Uh, and, and do you think that can be used to further uh, find 
identify uh, victims and perhaps uh, help uh, uh, remediation. Correct. So uh, using third-party services like Canary tokens, you know, that, that would leave logs which can be recovered and tracked, uh, sometimes even by the service providers. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, they, can, they can be used uh, in any form. Uh, the problem here is that uh, Canary tokens are not usually, um, you know, something like Canary tokens is not usually by, uh, blocked, is, is a part of block lists. So it becomes a problem for various remediation teams to figure out whether this is actually red team activity or this is an actual adversary in your networks that's actually doing some uh, activity of this form. All right, so th thank you. Uh, we have uh, some more general uh, question as well that everyone can, can answer. Um, uh, so uh, th there was a question about uh, if we are seeing, uh, if there's an increase in trends in malware trying to steal or generate cryptocurrencies um, on, on non-traditional targets. Is this something we've you've seen or? So I'm not the the, the expert at uh, at ESET in in that field. Um, what's super common is uh, is uh, IoT botnets deploying uh, miners there for s some reason because those are not really powerful machines. Um, what's what's more. Uh, what makes the most money, I guess, is stealing rather than mining crypto, um, and that that's uh, that's going on quite uh, quite intensely right now. Yes. Yeah, mining requires, I think, uh, a huge botnet rather than stealing, where you just have a single target that you must compromise. So, malware research, you know. We've been doing well. The, the the field of malware research has been has been there for about 30 years now. It's quite uh, quite long. Uh, recently, we've seen a uh, new kind of uh, uh, not job title, but uh, you know, uh, helping in 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 this this research uh, called uh, threat researchers, uh, where uh, there's um, uh, uh, people with uh, no or a little uh, knowledge about reverse engineering, uh, trying to uh, identify malware campaigns and so on. Um, do you think that there's uh, uh, a risk that uh, attacks get wrongly attributed or that there's missing technical information uh, when, uh, so that if, do you think that there's a trend that we are uh, perhaps uh, not giving the, the 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 public the 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 fact, factual or scientific output. Um, for sure, I think the first part is that attribution is hard. So there's many many threats, and some of them use common uh, TTPs, right? Tactics procedures. And it is hard sometimes to distinguish them between themselves. But I do think it's kind of like a best effort. And because there's so much industry collaboration in the field, I find it makes it so much easier for researchers. And so it ultimately helps the public have uh, the best information. It's not perfect, but it's a best effort, I find. I think um, the truth is in the code. <laughs> so whenever malware is involved, you can't fully understand what's going on without reverse engineering thoroughly uh, the, the samples. Um, we actually had a case last week, I think, where um, some, some people put up a blog post saying they found similarity between in Destroyer 2 and another malware family. And they used the code similarity analysis techniques and indeed, there were some parts of the code in Industry 2 that was very, uh, pretty much identical to parts of the code in that other malware family, which I forgot the name of. Um, so they were like, oh, why, why is this going on? Is, is there a connection with, the, with, with that? Um, the, 
problem is that one of our uh, reverse engineers spotted that the code similarity was in like st standard libraries that are probably present in 75% of C code. Um, so yes, there was similarity, but the person doing the analysis didn't understand what they were looking at. So that led to some very, very wrong attribution. And uh, we actually called it out, I think, um, nicely. But, uh, and they updated the blog post saying further research showed that so oh, it's not a real connection. But, so it's important to pay attention to those uh, two reversing because, as I said, the truth is in the code, I believe. Hi there. Okay. Um, I guess I want to add to that to uh, Leon and Alex. They both make valid points about code, and uh, you know that's where a lot of the pudding is. Uh, but also, I've seen code that would uh, trick analysts into thinking that uh, oh, this attribution. I see some interesting strings. Like it may look like it comes from a particular group, and. Uh, and, and this is where I think the original question was, you know, there are individuals out there that do data analysis. They try to look at this. Um, they try to make, uh, I guess, with whatever existing data they're looking at to make attribution. Uh, they are also, those individuals also are important in a controversially speaking manner. But I think the key is when you have reversers and analysts work together. And uh, that's also kind of where I come from in my field of work. And I, I have to always, I create a lot of um, uh, write-up on what I've reversed, but also I work with analysts to see what they have on their end. And it's a lot of discussion from there on. And I think it's, it's like that. It's, it's a hard thing, attribution, but it's a never-ending uh, process. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, so uh, we we've seen we've seen it during the the, inv the invasion of Ukraine, but also in in previous conflict. Uh, but I, I think it's it's been uh, I think it's never been as clear uh, during the past few months in Ukraine that malware uh, is used in in the context of war. Um, do you think that malware research uh, as a field as an impact outside of the technical sphere. So we talk about, about we talk a lot about our, our analysis. But do you think that our work actually uh, has repercussion outside of the technical crowd? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But to what extent? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, it has some repercussion. Um, how, how much? It's hard to tell. You know, if, if you document a, a campaign or an attack uh, that was never discovered before, you're going to expose tactics. You're going to expose uh, assets used by, by the attackers. Uh, some attackers will immediately like pivot to a, something totally different. Some attackers will keep using the same C2s, the same malware, just tweak it a little bit. In, in those cases, did, did the publication really have an impact? Maybe not, or it helped people defend better, I guess. Um, so it's a, it's a trick question. I, I think we, we'll never know how much impact our publications will have, uh, because those impacted are governments, and they won't call us saying, hey, screw you, you, uh, you messed up our attack, or something like that. Anyone else? No. Okay. I'd like to hear uh, Ashir's <laughs> take on that one. <laughs> sure. uh, so, so I believe that the, the intelligence that we generate uh, leads to protection mechanisms. You know, existing pro enhancement of existing mechanisms as well as creating new mechanisms. And uh, when we stop an attack at the right time, whether it's for uh, a, a critical services, you know, utility or for a hospital. Uh, we don't know, we, we, we don't really, at, in certain instances, we don't really know uh, how much of the attack we actually stopped and, you know, how much of the damage we actually prevented. And, uh, you know, that's a conundrum because, you know, we want to stop an attack as soon as possible. But if we do that, you know, sometimes we don't know the scope of the entire operation. 
And um, so it's very important, the work that we do, even if we publish disclosures where the attackers are not forced to change their TTPs, I'm very sure that in one form or the other, we are protecting some of our customers or the, you know, the general public uh, as a whole. We have two, two uh, interesting questions from the audience. Um, the first one is regarding the trust of the security vendors, so the security products you install. Uh, how do you address the issue of trusting that vendor uh, and the possibility that it may be cons compromised or uh, over oversight by their respective government? That's that's a political question, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Not really a technical question. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that, honestly, this is out of my field of qualifications, <laughs> and I'm not qualified okay. for... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Captain <laughs> Kangaroo. Um, the other one was... Uh, Yes, the other one was uh, whether um, we've seen an increase in, in mobile uh, malware um, and, uh, versus desktop malware or... Versus what? Desktop malware, oh. like regular stuff we see. I've got another one. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, he said it's, it's for the, the, the noobs, but I don't think it's... it's it's, I think it's a good question, is, is about how attribution works. How, how do we decide uh, to, to publish uh, an assessment on uh, the, the, uh, uh, that this attack was performed by a particular group? Um, and if we have thresholds for thinking we have enough evidence or clues that um, it's, uh, it's them. It's a, it's a difficult question, actually. I can try. Yeah, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> um, so I guess it's how do you assess? How do you? Yeah. Um, uh, it's a hard one, and every time I have to write an Intel report on a piece of malware, I am constantly reviewed and critiqued on my assessment. <laughs> uh, but a lot of the criteria is, it's, I guess it's easier for those as reverse engineers because you look at code and that's a bit more factual and that can, especially if you see a particular technique doing something and it, then it can, then it's a high probability, a high confidence that that proves that thing. But you can, uh, but when it comes to answering questions like do you know or can you foresee how this piece of malware or this attacker will plan their next move, that's difficult. And that's not an assessment that I, would like to write, and I try to avoid that. Uh, so it depends on the individual. So when I do an assessment, it's very technical, and that's how I like to keep it. I agree with that. And I'd also like to add that sometimes we do let, get lucky. Um, so the OPSEC of the threat actors is not always on point, and it happens where we do get lucky, and we kind of gain extra insights into who these people are, who these people are, or um, how are they doing things and why. And it's purely out of luck. So this does happen. And th there's no one recipe to attribute an attack to, to a, a threat actor. If, there, if there's one, uh, well, we're not aware of it. Uh, and there's, it's, it's about comparing different indicators. Some are really strong uh, or stronger. Some are weaker, but they still matter. Um, there are technical indicators, for example, the reuse of, a, of an IP address that is not like a shared hosting provider, for example. That's a fairly good indicator. It's not foolproof, but it's a good indicator. The, the malware itself, have we seen that malware before? Is that, that malware was attributed previously uh, by the industry as being operated by a single entity that is labeled as I don't know, APT something. Um, and then you've got the targeting, you've got uh, other software TTPs, uh, use of like spear phishing or whatever, like that are all put together. You can make an assessment that everything points to a campaign that was launched by this, this known actor. Um, but again, it's, it's an assessment. It's, not a, it's rarely a 100% determination.
Do you want to add anything, Ishir? Sure. So uh, I agree with everyone on the panel. Uh, attribution is hard, and um, it tends to be very subjective at times. It depends on the amount of in information you have. You know, the output of your reversing exercises, as well your, as your uh, institutional knowledge, and looking at open source intelligence and code similarities and stuff like that. What I also want to highlight here is that it's okay if you can't attribute stuff. It's it's that's that's not a problem. You know, we can convey doubt in an effective manner, and that's completely okay and justified. You know, I'd rather convey doubt more effectively rather than come up with the wrong attribution any day of the week. All right. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank thanks to everyone for your presentation. Mm -hmm.